This program is brought to you in part by Sal Cal Real Estate Connections. Yes, welcome to Race in Action Today talk series. As today we have a very special guest, and he is the, what I call the radio talk show icon. <laughs> number one. Number two, he is the part of the, the fearsome threesome from the TV show, The Telescope View. And beside that, his dynamic personality, he's involved with many, many, many charities throughout the state. And Steve Parker, I want to tell you it's a pleasure to have you here today. And today we're going to talk about the history about radio. Oh, really? Oh, wait a yeah. minute. We're talking about the history of radio today? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first one I had was a little channel master transistor yeah. radio. You remember those? Yeah. Hey, I remember the tubes. Never mind the transistors. <laughs> Yeah, we had that. We had those at the house too. Yeah, you know, in the early days, it was so different. Oh, you know, yeah. yeah. Of course, you grew up with this. Oh yeah. You know, your dad, your famous dad, yeah. Charlie. Yep. Yeah. Which I believe we have some pictures. That, I have a picture of him. You know. Oh really? We'll, we'll let the viewers. I see got his here. driver's license. Will that help you at and, all? <laughs> uh, you know, he's got quite a history. Yeah. yeah. But I, I tell me, what is your regulation? about how, you know, the history of radio in this state. I well, mean, you know, I, I kind of I, I kind of grew up uh, in radio. My mom and dad actually uh, met at WDRC in, in World War, during World War II. Uh, my dad had, was a Navy man, and right after he got out of basic, uh, basic training during World War II, they realized that he had a sway back, where if he stood against a wall, his back went like this. So he was discharged. And here he was. It was World War II. He was yeah. Navy. He couldn't wait to go. Couldn't wait and, to go. Yeah, and he was a radio man in the Navy. So what they did was um, he was looking for a job. And he went into Hartford. And when he was walking around Hartford, uh, he saw WDRC. And he always loved WDRC. He used to listen to it all the time. So he, uh, he called up there, wanted to know if he could have a tour. So they opened, him up, they opened up the door, let him in, and gave him a tour on the spot. And then once they realized his, his background... Um, as far as, you know, being a radio guy. Yeah, hands they, on, hands yeah. on. Oh, yeah. And they hired him on the spot. And the wild thing is, the woman that let him in there was the woman he married years later. Oh, and, uh, my dear. That's my mom. So, oh, my yeah. dear. So wow. when people ask me how many years I've been in, uh, in radio, I listen to everybody. Oh, I've been here 30 years. I've been here 40 years. They say, how many years is it for you, Steve? I go, that's 68. And they, huh? Well, it's <laughs> because as soon as I was making noises as a kid, huh? <laughs> My dad put a microphone in front of me, oh, wow. and that's when I was bitten by the bug at birth. Um, but I, I also grew up in a time when radio was everything. And when you look at what it was, um, DJs were rock stars. Well, I, can't, I, mean, I remember. I mean, WPOP and... Don't talk about that. <laughs> I was WDRC. There I mean, was no WPOP. It was famous. It was, we would go back and forth. Oh, yeah, between 1360 AM and 1410. Yeah, that's it. Right next to each other. Yep. yep. The rock and roll wars. Everybody knew them around yeah. the country. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, the famous people that oh. evolved oh. out of this. Yeah. You know. Yeah, amazing. You know. Guys like uh, Dick Robinson. Yeah. I remember when my dad hired him out of nowhere as a kid. It was a big, like, six-foot-two or whatever uh, lanky yeah. kid. And he had a following. When he went on the radio at night at WDRC... Everybody else could just disappear because his following was huge. Oh, and yeah. And the kids I mean, loved them. I mean, not only that, the talent. Oh, yeah. yeah. The people with making records. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's go back. Mm -hmm. Elvis. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a kid out of Mississippi. Tupelo, right? Mississippi. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Sun Records. Yep. And... Mm -hmm. But again, that came down to Colonel Parker. No relationship to me. Yeah. But um, yeah. Colonel Parker was all about, he looked at him as a, as a dollar sign. Yeah. And realized that by pushing him and making him famous, he'd make a lot of money. You know? And so, that's, still the, that's still usually the driving force behind music, is there's a manager or an agent or somebody who looks at you as somebody who says, I'm going to make money if I... Yeah, but you know, Steve, back then, it was the radio. Oh, yeah. I mean, TV started to come into effect, yep, yes. Yep. But it was the radio that made these people known. Oh, yeah. And yep. music was being played all over the country. Yep. You know? And that's when, well, when radio made the transition, because radio was always the theater of the mind, okay? Yeah. That was really 
to this day, I always say radio is so much more creative than television. Sorry, everybody. But when it comes down to the theater of the mind, whether yeah. you're creating commercials. Yeah. I mean, when I'm on WTIC radio on Saturday mornings, 5.30 a.m. till 8.30 a.m. Uh, when I'm on there, um, everybody knows what I look like. Oh, sure. They because do. they've decided in their own mind what I look like. It was funny. The other day we were at a birthday party and we're talking with somebody and, and they're, they're telling me, yeah, I was listening to the radio Saturday morning about this, about Dr. Haynes. Uh, I said, I didn't know who you were listening to. He said, oh, Steve Parker. He said, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. There's not, um, there's not a lot of radio stations these days that's, that are even live anymore. Mm -hmm. a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the DJs that you hear and everything else, it's all pre-recorded. Yeah, yep. You know, they're not even live in the studio. And we are at WTIC. Not only are you live, you're a distance. I oh. am totally amazed, yeah. Steve, yeah. at how far people could hear your station. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a it's a 50,000 watt AM signal, which is very rare. There's only a few of them in the country. And as a result, um, like my girl, Angela, listened for five hours driving to Maine. But I have another friend of mine who says, yeah, but I can't hear you in Cheshire. Because huh. what will happen, it's the the shape of an AM signal mm -hmm. can can moving back and forth and stuff. Oh. Um, so, you know, when it's, it's, it, it's funny that way if something could be that close, it's hard. But then, like, she listened five hours going to Maine. You know, and, but it's always been um, the difference with radio and, tele and to television is that it's always intimate. Like, if somebody's, um, when you're reading a book, it's one-to-one. -one. When you're listening to the radio, it's one-to-one. -one. And you feel that connection. You know, with yeah. television, yes, yeah, somewhat. But, but not like that was radio. I could see, when I was a little kid, I used to listen to Amos and Andy. You oh, God, that? yes, yes. And, and, and laugh and laugh and laugh. I mean, it was just amazing, you know. And like you said, when you were on the radio, you remember the days about making the horses? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, all sound effects. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my dear. Yeah, that was a Foley box, and they yep. made out in that box they can make all those the sound effects. Yeah, yeah. But oh yeah, it was um, it was really really wild. In fact, when you go back to like Amos and Andy and a lot of those old shows, Charlie McCarthy was huge. Now Charlie McCarthy was a ventriloquist on the radio. On so the stop radio. and think about it. A ventriloquist. Yeah. When you're looking at him, you can't see the lips move. Yeah. He was on the radio. Yeah. You know, and with, with, with the puppet, all right? Yeah. <laughs> and still had a huge audience. Yeah. But there was a, um, the, the changeover came, you know, back into the 50s and yeah. into the yeah. 60s, and things really started to come around. However, still, I mean, radio was king, and still is. It's huge. It's huge. Even to this day, there's a lot of different versions of it. But see, if you go all the way back, all the way back, and you were talking before about the history of, of, of radio here yes. in Connecticut. Yes. All right. Now, when you go back and look at uh, WDRC, which was where my dad was, that was the Doolittle Radio Corporation. And Franklin Doolittle was one of the pioneers of radio. In fact, um, WDRC uh, just celebrated last year uh, in 2022. It was um, 100 years old, the oldest radio station in Connecticut. And Franklin Doolittle... Um, actually created uh, the first commercial FM radio station in the world. In the world. So these wow. guys were pioneers back then. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's amazing because I still talk to Franklin's son, and his son is in his 80s now. And uh, we'll just talk different stories about his dad and yeah. my dad. But um, And then WTIC came around in 1925. So... Um, and that was, of course, you know, eventually Bob Steele got on there. And, yeah. you know, it was pretty much the old fart radio station. Oh, yeah. My, so, oh, yeah. My father, every oh, yeah. morning, he had to have Bob Steele on. Always. <laughs> yeah. And I know it's funny because at my house, it was always rock and roll. Yeah. So people said, when, when kids today say, well, you know, I grew up listening to Bob Steele. I said, yeah. I said, because if your mother saw you try to go across the kitchen floor to turn on Big D, she would have broken your arm. Oh, yeah, You know, yeah. parents Bob, always Bob, had Bob on. Steve, rock and roll was big. I oh, yeah, mean, huge, we huge. Can, I'm not going to downplay it. Yep. It was huge, yep. you know. Well, you know, it's interesting because even WDRC, they way back, they had like the live orchestras in the studio and all yeah, that. Yeah, But when my dad um, 
was the program director, probably back in the late 80s, is when, uh, late 50s is when he got the job. But then on August 18th of 1960, he made the decision to turn it from, you know, a lot of the old music and the CBS, yeah, yeah. the network stuff. It was very, very, yeah. but he saw rock and roll and knew what it was going to be because all the baby boomers, oh, yeah. which was, going, was, was enormous. Yeah. They were all going to need, they're all, they all wanted the music, but really what was important too was they were going to need banks. They were going to need car dealerships. They, they were going to need furniture stores. So this whole baby boomer group that was growing so rapidly didn't have any of that. So by putting a rock and roll radio station on the air, you would um, be attracting advertisers too, because they wanted you want to be you want to be the kids' first bank. You oh, want to sure. be the car dealer. You want to be that. Oh, absolutely. And the smart advertisers then really knew how to go after them. Oh, sure but, they did. Uh, but oh, but but again. My dad used to talk about um, how people, a lot of people gave him credit for the success of the radio stations because he had this great imagination. He came yeah, up with all these great he, ideas. He had foresight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had a woman there. Her name was Bertha Porter. And Bertha was a record librarian. That's what you called him back then. Bertha was so good at picking new music. They knew about Bertha coast to coast. And everybody wanted to get on DRC. They wanted, if Bertha thought they were going to be a hit, they yeah. usually were. Yeah. So um, She recognized talent right away. Right away. And yeah. they would, I mean, the Rolling Stones came to the radio station to thank her for playing their music. Oh, I mean, sure, come on. Sure. But you, all, my dad used to say it was her talent for the music. But then he had the talent for all the crazy contests, the DJs and all that. Yeah. So he would always say, you know, when, when they'd say how great he was, he goes, no, no, no. It was Bertha with the music. But Bertha, um, Bertha, it was like family to me. You know? He knew how to market it. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And believe me, <clears throat> the opportunity was there. Yeah. But he recognized it and mm. made it happen, right? Oh, yeah. Plus, plus it was, there was nothing better as a kid than having your dad running the biggest radio station. Oh, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> Every kid. It was so funny in school. You go, what does your dad do? What does your dad do? Yeah. <laughs> I said, WDR. Yeah. Oh, my dear. Oh, can you get us records? <laughs> oh, I, I can still hear the music. <clears throat> yep. I, I, honest, I, I, I can. Yeah, well, and you know, it, it, was such, um, it was such a time where music was just coming into its own with the rock and roll and all yeah, that. It yeah. was beautiful stuff. And it's, it's, what, it's what people, um, when you think about it, kids would get a transistor radio like that, a little channel master, yep. or, and they would put their earplug in it. Now you have earbuds, you know, and they put their earplug in that, and they'd hide it under the pillow <laughs> so their mom wouldn't know that yeah. they're listening to yeah. Dickie Robinson or somebody, yep. and they'd have their earplug in there. Or they might have been listening to the Red Sox baseball yep. on a TIC or something. Well, I mean, baseball was huge. Well, you know, it's still the best on the radio anyway. I mean, when you think about, like today, football's huge, but yeah. back then, baseball yeah. was huge, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was always, um, but again, when you listen to sports on the radio, Joe D., who did UConn for years, and he would describe, he would tell you, if you're looking at your radio, if you're looking at your radio, you know, to the left is this, to the left is that, yeah. describing where the teams were playing. Yeah. But... You could turn the volume, a lot of people did turn the volume off of television because it wasn't anywhere as clear as what Joe and some of the other guys did you know, Steve, back then. I have to tell you something. This past weekend, I was watching games on the TV, the yeah. football games. I was so annoyed with the announcers, I turned the sound off. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. My wife kept yelling at me, why is there no... <laughs> I said, I can't stand what, what they're saying. So you watched the game, I watched but you didn't have to listen did, to what was going I, on. I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and what's really good, too, I mean, when you listen to the really talented play-by-play -play guys, yeah. like the radio play-by-play -play guys, they got to be able to ad-lib all over oh, the sure, place. Sure they do. You know, sure. and I like when they talk to so last night, I went out with my wife. She went, and that's ball four? You know, and then uh, we went out and had dinner. The swing! <laughs> like, yeah. know, they go back and forth from describing the game well, to what's well, going on. You, you, you hit it best. You have to play the moment. Yeah. I mean, you got to make people feel like they're in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, of course, Steve, the other thing that you get involved with, I'm sure 
is the Vintage Radio and Communication oh. Museum. Oh, it's incredible. Now, I'm going to have to get up there because I heard it's absolutely... You haven't gone yet? No, I haven't gone yet. Larry's the one guy that hasn't gotten up there yet. Yeah, I'm okay. going to have to get there. Oh. I heard it was fantastic. Larry, it's like stepping back in time. It's amazing. Um, and it's just uh, John Ellsworth that runs the place. He's collected everything. Now Hollywood goes there because oh, they want to use... His equipment, in TVs, because right. okay. and all this stuff works. In uh, what do you mean when they make a movie? We make a movie yeah. or a television series. Yeah. We've had, especially now with Hallmark and all that stuff, we've had a lot of movies shot in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. They just did the Willie Pep story, and when they were making the movie about Willie Pep, in being a Hartford area, they went right to them looking for like they had a TV set. A TV set didn't work. No. So they called those guys, and John gets his guys, and they well, can. I mean, when you looked at TV back then, oh my dear. <laughs> Keep smacking it on the side. Oh my! The horizontal going like oh boy, that. Oh boy! Oh <clears> boy! <throat> but the radios, the yeah. older radios, oh, yeah. they were special. Short yeah. wave and everything, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, even that uh, with Doolittle before he ever got onto broadcast, he was doing short wave, ship to shore, and all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah, with radio. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's all gotten to the point now where it's it's changed a lot. But like my dad, this is how his mind worked though. When people, like when FM became real popular, and DRC was the first commercial FM in the world. So everybody thought FM was going to really overtake AM. But he used to say, he used to say, as long as it's interest, people will listen through a Kleenex box. That's right. They don't care. It's not AM or FM. Because nope, it's care. about so much more than the music. It's nope. not just about the music. Nope. And that's what I think a lot of people these days forget. Like, you'll hear, like, a, there's... People will, like some stations play a lot of oldies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but they don't really. Um, it's so much more than just the music, because with DRC, my dad was a big believer in contests like the Secret Sound and all these contests he came up with, because he knew people liked to play. So you would listen to the contests because you might be at home and go, Oh man, I know what the answer is. I know that. And you, as a result, you're like playing. You know, yeah. with the with the radio, yeah. And so he would come up with you know just crazy contests that would be so much fun to to play with, and well, that's sure. why people stayed. You know, like I said, I mean, radio was it at that anyway. during the early years. Boy, that was it. No, yeah. so tell me some of the some of the music you like to listen to. What was well, some back of the... then? I loved rock and roll with Elvis uh -huh. and and, uh, and you know Johnny B. Good. And, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know. Oh yeah, Roy Orbison. Oh. And matter of fact, I mean, I used we used to go to New Haven had the bandstand. You oh, remember? Yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, and Hartford had it with Brad Davis with yes, the Connecticut yeah, bandstand. Yeah. Well, yeah. Brad, he's another one. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, he he was in that time frame. Oh yeah. You know, with the kids and <sighs> DJs became, they were like, oh yeah, sought yeah. after yeah. like you wouldn't believe. Oh yeah. You and know, a friend when, of mine, um, a friend of mine that's. Uh, uh, his dad used to run WHAY, which turned, is now WRCH. And that's out of New Britain, Connecticut. That's mm -hmm. where it started. But his stepdad was, um, used to play the drums for Buddy Holly. Ooh, wow. And he also was the manager of the Kingsman, uh, Dion Warwick. Yeah. A lot of these, these were guys that back then he, uh, really you know, worked with the talent. See, some of the talent was talented. But if they didn't have somebody who promoted them, they wouldn't have gone anywhere. No. Now, you know, Elvis Presley would not have ever made it without Colonel Parker. Yeah. Colonel Parker. I mean, he would, had the talent for yep. the time. And like they said, he was a white man dancing like, uh, like a an African-American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was Which, it. Uh, as oddly as that sounds, yep. it was the truth. Yep, yep. You know? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that was something where... Um, if you go up and look at, uh, um, when you look at uh, the Jackson 5, Joe Jackson, well, he was a tyrant. And they used to say that, you know, he would, you know, he would hit the kids and everything else. But yep. look where they went. The Beach Boys, yep. you know, with their dad. I mean, they, I mean, he was another madman. But without that father going to the radio stations to say, you got to play this. They're push, great. Push, Yeah. Yeah, they that never was like, done it. Uh, you know, the, the female... Um, country singer, her husband you know, would drive all over the country. Oh yeah. What was it? Who was that now? 
Was that was it Patsy Cline or was oh, it might have Loretta been Lynn? I, oh, it might have been Loretta Lynn. Yeah, they'll be calling us now and telling us if they. Whenever yeah. I say yeah. something like whenever I say something like that on the radio, I mean, my phones light up. Her husband will literally drive all over the country yep. to yep. play her records. Oh yeah, yeah. And she became famous. Well, I tell you what was really something. Many many years ago, Helen Reddy. Now Helen Reddy had like uh, I don't know how to love him. Uh, I am woman. I think her first one was I don't know how to love him. She got in her car, and she drove all the way to Hartford so she could hear her song on the radio because DRC believed in her and played it. Then she went to a phone booth, called my father, and said, thanks a lot for believing in me. Yeah, you know, and those are the, that's what radio stations could do back then, was well, they, they could well, make they, or break they somebody. They had the power, oh, let yeah. me tell you. Yeah. I can remember going to Mount Tom oh, boy. in Mass to hear the Kingsman. Wait. Louie, right. Louie. Yep. Oh, gee. oh, you should oh, hear. Man. That's oh, my man. that's my buddy Jeff Bell. He could tell you those stories. Oh, oh. my God! Cause Jeff traveled with the Kingsman. Yeah, he, and he still knows those guys. He still yeah. talks to yeah. them all the time. I mean, they, it was great. I'll tell you. And let's talk about when the Beatles showed up, huh? Oh yeah, that was another. That was phenomenal. Crazy. I, that's what I call crazy. Huh? You know, just a phenomenon. You yep. know what I mean? Well, you know, it's funny because um, when that all happened. Um, WDRC and WPOP were always trying to get the Beatle record first because the Beatle record would always be a smash, yeah, always be yeah, a hit because yeah, the kids were, couldn't wait. Yeah, yeah. And we had a connection, DRC had a connection with the Beatles. We actually had one of our guys, his name was Long John Wade, who used to travel with them. So we had a connection directly to the Beatles where we could get the records before the record label would get them. So that drove POP crazy because what would happen was my dad, sometimes he'd wake us up in the middle of the night and we'd have to drive almost all the way to New York to meet somebody on the side of the road who would yeah. give us the new yeah, Beatle yeah, record. Yeah. And then what he would do before it went on the air, he would make sure that he recorded it and every eh, 20, 30 seconds you'd hear, Big D exclusively. <laughs> so P.O.P. couldn't record it. No. So it had to have that. And that was my 11th birthday. I got tickets thanks to Bertha Porter to go to Shea Stadium to see the Beatles for oh, my wow, 11th birthday. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Now, some crazy things happened during these. I can remember in P.O.P., yeah. somebody locked themselves in the oh. station and well, played a song all night well, long. Well, Joey, Joey who, Reynolds. Who was that? Joey, actually, Joey Reynolds locked himself at the radio station at DRC, and the song was in the midnight hour. And what he did was, uh, was the record got stuck. So what happened was you, um, you, kept, uh, you kept hearing in the midnight, in the midnight, in the midnight. Well, he, what happened was he got into so much trouble and the police came and they broke the door down <laughs> because they thought he was in trouble in the studio. Yeah, yeah, they didn't know what was going on. Now, the funny thing is they really did. The police went in and arrested him on the radio. But the funniest part was my dad, his boss, was in the kitchen at our house laughing hysterically while Joey was getting nailed. Yeah, yeah. And who's your program director? Charles yeah. R. Parker. Yeah. You know, but, put, the, put the cuffs on. Yeah. But <laughs> he knew he knew that it was one of these things that would get all kinds of statewide, you know, yeah. national attention. But Joey was crazy. But see, when my dad would hire DJs, he saw a talent. Now he knew that guys like Joey and Kenny Griffin and a lot of these guys were the early shock jocks. Yeah, yeah. They were they they were the ones that would really create all the trouble. Yeah. But that's why he hired them. He really? hired them yeah, because yeah. he knew they were the bad well, boys. He he saw the talent. Oh, so he knew, but he also yeah. knew how he could make them. They were bad. You he know, could make them even worse. Got to remember, <laughs> he was the marketing man. Yeah. He yeah. made it happen. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah. And uh, thank God everyone had him and. To this day, they're probably still celebrating, Steve. Oh yeah. Of what his accomplishments were. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's fun because you know, have, growing up in the business, I still have everybody. We do a thing every Friday morning at nine forty-five. Every Friday morning, it's a Zoom, and um, you know, we all get together on this. But every single week, we do it. And it's a bunch of guys getting together. We call ourselves Radio Friends again. Yeah. And they're guys from different parts of the country. We've all worked in the business. A lot of these guys worked with my dad. And Larry, we get on there for about an hour. We just laugh and tell stories. 
It's just, it's like a reunion every single yeah, Friday when we get together. Yeah. And that's, that's beautiful. Uh, you that's, know? And, and it's, you know, it's really funny, Larry. All, a lot of these guys work with my dad. My dad discovered a lot of guys like um, Billy Hart, who became Bill St. James. Um, he had a, a big Beatles show called Flashback that he did for many yeah. years. But he also traveled with NBC for the Olympics to Japan. He was a big voice. Well, guys like that, my dad pulled out of Hall High School in West Hartford. And these kids, a lot of them went on well, to be sure, very, very sure, famous. You know. But they, ne they never forget their roots. Oh, no, no, no. But he also was, was good, Larry, in a way where, as a program director, he believed in finding a talent. And then what he would do is he would direct you where to take your talent. Yeah. He wouldn't tell you how to do it. Yeah. He knew what you were capable of. So, you know, and I always say really good directors, like if, if somebody's a really good actor, but if you can spend time with Steven Spielberg, Spielberg can show you how to be a great actor. Oh, sure. So my yeah. dad knew how to do that with his guys. Well, hey, you know, he, he had his place in history. No, no, no oh, doubt, Steve. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. And, uh, you know, this museum, the, uh, the Da Vinci Radio. Oh, Da Vinci Radio, Radio Communications Museum? They also do something with radio. What do you call it? Amateur uh, Well, radio, they, they, right? they do a lot of stuff. Like every, um, I think five times a year, they do swap meets. Mm -hmm. And you go over there, and people bring stuff over oh, there wow. that they've had in their attic or in their yeah. cellar. And they'll sell or swap with other guys that come in from all over the Northeast. Yeah, but when you walk that. in there, he's got a studio set up, a real studio set up inside there. The stuff that he has, even if you don't care about radio, he has radio, TV, a lot of telephones. Yeah, we'll it's all to, about communication. We'll have to get there. Oh yeah, you John, you can, and I think you could probably have John come in here and do a show with you too. He's yeah, terrific. Why not? Mm. You know, Steve, when we're having fun, time flies, and we come to the end of our show, <laughs> they'll, they'll probably kick us out of I here. Again, we're gone. But I want to thank you. For the excellent show tonight. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure to get together with you. And, of course, you, the viewers, you heard her first here on Race in Action today. And we'll be back with Mr. Parker to do more shows in the future. Really? Well, we want to thank you for being with us. And, yes, we'll get our brother Rick involved. They want me to do more shows. The fearsome threesome. We, I didn't we'll... know about this. Is there a contract somewhere? <laughs> Look at that <laughs> fine print. I'm sure. Well, we'll get something together. <laughs> Thank you and good night. This program is brought to you in part by Just Results Weight Loss Center in Berlin, Connecticut. Sometimes life just happens. Don't worry. Farmington Motorsports will get you back on the road and at a fair price. From towing to tires, emissions to transmissions. Our ASC certified techs do it all. Farmington Motorsports is a family-run business. We're in Napa Auto Center and AAA approved. We work on all makes and models from preventative maintenance to major repairs. And every repair is backed by our two-year, 24,000-mile nationwide warranty. When life happens to you, don't worry. Farmington Motorsports.